uh, we'll go and listen to. Um, released in 1982, it's the Fool's fourth album. Uh, and I thought just to tee up what John had to say about him, I thought it was worth reading a little extract from Mark's fantastic book, Renegade, in which he says, Hex Induction Hour was a big fuck off to the music industry. It was probably the first time I'd got to a point where I knew I was alone with my ideas. And you can go in either one of two ways, either curb your thinking, rein yourself in and buy what they're telling you, or follow your own path regardless. And so I just went through on that album. But I must admit, throughout parts of the recording, I thought that this is it. This is the last one we're going to do. So it does sound like, in that context, it does sound like a band and following their creative instincts and putting everything they've got into it. And it's certainly, I think, one of their more abrasive and uncompromising albums. Uh, it's definitely the, the closing of one chapter of the group and leaning on to something else. So that's enough for me. Uh, we're very lucky that um, John Doran has decided to come down uh, and do an introduction to the, um, to the album. Uh, sure he needs no introduction, but anyway, as his customary, I'll give him one anyway. Um, is the co-founder and editor of The Quietus, probably one of the most fantastic out, uh, champions of exciting and radical music. Uh, and he's uh, written a fantastic memoir called Jolly Lad, which if you haven't checked out, you might really must. It's fantastic, uh, fantastic writing. Uh, and also done, as interviewed Marky Smith numerous times, one of the best interviews I think is the one from uh, noisy, which is on YouTube, and you can watch it if you haven't already. It's uh, really, really fantastic. So, without further ado, please welcome John Doran. Okay. Uh, hello, how's it going? Uh, last time I was on this stage, I was DJing. I was so fucking high. I kept on about that. I must have banged my head on it about 20 times. <laughs> All things change. Um, so, I'm going to try and keep this relatively short. I say that, but I've printed out these sheets, there's fucking millions of them. <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm quite nervous, so I'll read really quickly, and then hopefully we'll get through it. Uh, now, so, I, I, I do a bit of DJing occasionally, uh, where I play kind of just four sets all night. And I think, you know, maybe the first time I ever did this, where, like, I, I've gone on about this at length before, you know, I got into the fall in about... 83, 84, when I first heard Tempo House on John Peel. But really, I don't think I became like a really proper fall fan until about 15, 16, 17 years ago. And it was around, you know, it was kind of getting into their newer stuff, really, that kind of really hammered it home to me how good they were. And anyway, I did a... Um, uh, I remember, it might have been for his 50th birthday, I remember doing this thing where I'm going to play fall music all night in a bar called Catch 22, I think it was, in, um, near, near Shoreditch or whatever. And we were like, this will be really good, you know, I'll get to see what fall fans in London are like. I only really know fall fans in Manchester or whatever. <laughs> and so, like, you know, I, I said on the website or whatever, we're going to play fall all night and some related music. I remember just, like, playing this set. And 90 minutes, non-stop fall music. And I just thought, I'm going to... I'm just going to switch it up a little bit now, just for the sake of being slightly dynamic. And I put on... Um, Sonic Youth's cover version of Rouch Rumble, and immediately this guy started sprinting from the bar to me and he came over to me and went, What the fuck's this shit? Because I'd have known it was going to be some student indie fucking disco. I wouldn't have bothered coming, you fucking cunt. And he dropped his drink on the floor and ran out. Now, the reason why I mention this is, is like, I'm guessing I probably. <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm, I'm, we're going to talk a bit about Hex Induction Hour, and in the, I, I haven't set out to make anyone angry or upset anyone, but if I do, probably best to leave it until I've finished, and then we can have a discussion about it. Normally at these things I'd say, like, uh, do you, you want me to do a Q&A, yeah? Yeah. But, um, yeah. Now the, the thing is, is like, normally these things, I kind of saying, all right, please bear in mind, Q stands for question, not long, drunken monologue that goes on for three hours. But actually, to be brutally honest, probably all of you know more about the fall than I do. So, and maybe it will be a bit of a discussion. Who knows? And if you and if if you don't want to do it before the album and you want to do it after the album, that's fine as well. Anyway, 
So, my name's John Dora and I write about music, and today's brief lecture is called Eine Kleine Licht Magic. Or is it called Eine Kleine Licht Zauber? Or is it called the hipster ritual of Hex Induction Hour by the Fall? Or is it called, did he just say what I think he said? <laughs> is the classical racist? Or is it called the entrancer uncovered? So, the dreaded day came to pass, and Ted Kessler's final excellent interview with Marky e. Smith for Q magazine touched in typical and inimitable style on the idea of posterity, saying, I've already got posterity. There's always some cunt who wants to ask me about a masterpiece I made in 1982. I humour them, but I'm making better records now. If I didn't believe that, I'd have retired in 1982. Reader, I was that cunt. <laughs> and this afternoon, or this evening, we're all those cunts as well, because we're looking back at Hex Induction Hour from 1982, which isn't the album that I play when I'm sat at home, although I'm glad I have been listening to it for the last few days, thinking about it for, the, for this evening. You know, I mean, like, you're all probably the same as me. I listen to later albums, you know, I've kind of trained my way into thinking that it's the, the, the album just gone is the best one. But um, there we have it. Hex is the received canonical supermassive black hole at the centre of the fall galaxy. Now, to be fair to Smith, he was absolutely accommodating when I quizzed him about Hex. I was humoured. Because I spent the first half an hour talking to him about the news, my job, whether I was courting or not, where I grew up and went to school, St Helens, you have my commiserations, <laughs> and where my mum and dad lived, and then another hour talking about the new album, Reformation Post TLC, it was in 2006, when I nervously asked, hand still shaking, despite now being three lagers and a large whiskey into the afternoon, if I could ask about Hex Induction Hour, and he said, of course you can, cock, and he was fine with it. And I'll have to, um, so he gave me enough, um, he gave me about 15 minutes talking to Hex, but it was noticeable that like he shifted through several gears and he was just giving me the same answers that I'd read a million times before. And after about 10 minutes, I really got the impression that it was time to change the subject. But you know, I, I was there on the uh, like record collector said, you can go and interview him about the new album if you get something on Hex. Because like everyone, even record collector knows what a big deal Hex is. So I wrote a piece for Record Collector. Now, this is when I was a practicing alcoholic and more importantly, a really, really awful journalist. You know, if you think I'm bad now, fuck me, you should have wrote me then. <laughs> awful. But you know, I, when I started The Quietness Up, I republished this feature about 10 years ago. And that was it, I forgot all about it. And then when, you know, the sad thing happened last month, I had the kind of unenviable job of sitting up all night at, at, at Quiet Towers and sorting through all of our kind of um, past features on, on The Fall. And there's a lot of them, you know. Like The Fall is the only band in the decade we've been running that has its own section on the site, for example. And um, I, I, I had to say that we've run some great features on the fall and the quietest, but my writing on Hex wasn't one of them, what a fucking awful piece. And like, you know, I, I, I could just see like a really junior writer who didn't know what he was doing, and it broke all of my cardinal rules that I had now. In the first paragraph alone, I mentioned the band in the context of them being a national institution, and then repeated Martin Brammer's daft assertion that they were like Coronation Street on acid. But worst of all, I kicked dirt over the use of the N-word. Now, this is how I dealt with the subject. From the opening combative, the classical, the album seethes with rancor. The opening line, were the obligatory N-words, hey there fuckface, although not racist in the context of the song, is unpleasant to say the least, and unsurprisingly cost them a record deal with Motown. What a load of shit. <laughs> So, essentially, I kicked dirt over it, or if you'll forgive me for mixing metaphors in the context of one sentence, I ended up with a load of painful splinters in my hoop from sitting on the fence. After Smith's death, the narrative played out on social media as it always does. So after the first wave of kind of heartbroken, genuinely upset people, and casually upset people, you know, casually upset music fans as well, posted on Twitter and Facebook, there was a smaller and all too predictable second wave of whataboutery from the grief police. 
All of it completely fair enough if looked at logically and dispassionately, even though the motivation for it stinks to high heaven. What about the appalling accusations levelled at him in Brick Star Smith's recent autobiography? What about his treatment of Julian Nagel? And what about the lyrics to the classical? So since his death, I've been turning down fall related stuff, left, right and centre, TV, radio, most feature writing offers, although I did do a five hour fall only DJ set up in Hebden a few weeks ago, it was amazing. I wish I was doing one tonight actually, to be honest, I'd be brilliant in this place. Um, and then when Michael offered a chance to do this, I wanted to say no because I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm really not sure that I've got anything new to add to it. And then I realised that actually I could just uh, um, assuage my terrible Catholic guilt by coming and talking about the mistake I made with this feature instead, whether you want me to or not. <laughs> so the first thing that I failed to do when writing about the classical was to put this in a solid contemporary context. Smith was far from the only musician dropping the N-word in this period. And both and beyond that, his use of the word was actually existed on a much longer continuum. One, if you follow Bjork on social media, that unfortunately continues to this day. The first use of this extremely harsh racial epithet I can find on record dates back to 1897. N-word in an oddity by the Metropolitan Orchestra, 1897. So this is being used in a completely derogatory term from the absolute ground zero of the music industry as we know it today. And if you look back through the Metropolitan Orchestra's uh, discography on the Berliner record label, they, they released a string of records at the turn of the century, turn of the previous century, with almost transcendentally racist titles. It's the sort of thing that a screwdriver would have sat around and gone, that's a bit harsh lads, isn't it? Come on. Um, so fast forward 70 or 80 years and step outside of neo-Nazi punk and like the kind of more um, kind of very, very sub-sub-sub-genre, which is, you know, the little tiny bit of the record industry that existed in that decade just to serve a kind of racist fan base. And actually you've got, um, you've got something totally, totally different. You've got... Um, mainly this vibe is hanging around in a kind of what I would call uh, a hipster area and I'm talking hipster in its original context pre uh, Shoreditch or whatever and you know we're not talking about Eric Clapton or David Bowie even you know these are right on people aren't they or are they I'm not sure actually Patti Smith rock and roll n-word James White and the Blacks almost black, kind of with those two. Oh, then we get to the gun club. Devil and the N-word, not sure about that one. Black Trey, definitely not sure about that one. For the love of Ivy, fuck off. <laughs> Elvis Costello, Oliver's Army. Again, you take the record on its own, but then read some other stuff about Costello, not sure. But still, you know, maybe more misguided. And probably his heart's in the right place. The Dead Kennedys, Holiday in Cambodia, and we've got a bigger problem now. Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, St. Hook, The Residents, Walter Westinghouse. The list goes on and on and on. You can Google for more if you want, but why the fuck would you? So there's a lot of this going on. And essentially to me, now in 2018, these are all examples of what I call hipster racism, bar the gun club who were just racist. This all exists on a continuum of edge lord artists, both, and I, you know, I know I write for Vice magazine, I'm kind of having to go myself here. Uh, edge lord artists both wanting to show how antagonistic to the mainstream they are, while also sending out a complex, if very confused message to the listeners, which in most cases seems to be A, I'm cool, B, I'm streetwise working class, not bourgeois middle class, C, I'm actually really rather relaxed around non-white people, to be honest. I'm uh, around them all the time. Uh, some of my best friends are black, which is why it's totally okay for me to use these epithet epithets. And D, confusingly, I'm also a bit of a racist. I just maybe don't know it yet. Now, this is a kind of badge of authenticity. Get with it, Dad. This is absolutely not r racist, but is it really? This kind of thing dates all the way back to rock music's er uh, hipsters, Lester Bangs, John Lennon, Bob Dylan, some of them an influence on Smith, to be honest. And they, have all, they all have form in this field. 
So it's been going on a long time. We can't single out Smith on his own. He exists in a continuum of a lot of people using this word in this very specific con context. So back to the classical. If you want to know anything about the lyrics of the fall, forget sleeve notes, forget that book even, what you need is the annotated fall website, which is the font of all knowledge. So I want to thank them because I've ripped them off mercilessly. <laughs> So the website, on the matter of the N-word, it says, you know, the first thing it says is this is clearly the most controversial lyric that The Fall ever wrote. And, you know, obviously that's true. But the website leans more toward The Fall's point of view, which is it's a sideswipe of those who only pay lip service to inclusivity while remaining intolerant at heart. Now, if you look at the lyric in the context, context of Smith's entire body of written work, and in the context of the song itself, it is totally believable. There are a few other lyrics in the Falls Back catalogue that suggest this is some kind of dog whistle or a case of him singing to the stalls or that he has a hidden racist agenda. I don't think he has. Smith always claimed he was being sarcastic with this line, but sarcasm or not, did it cost him a record deal with Motown for $46,000? I'm not sure what I make of that story. It sounds like typical Smith perversity. But here's what he said about the incident. We were just fucking around, then fucking Tamla Motown steam in. You know, what about the time we had another white act? Haha, <laughs> dead funny. But they were pretty serious. I went to see them and everything. They had a pretty good lad in London who was well behind us. So they offered us a contract. And this bloke in London goes, have you got any LPs? So I said, I'll get you a copy of Hex Induction Hour to you. There is, of course, a massive fall connection here with Motown Records. It's just that in temporal terms, it hasn't happened yet. The Fall would have one of their biggest hits with a song written by the genius American, African-American songwriting team of Holland, Dozier and Holland for one of Motown's rare white signings, R. Dean Taylor and Ghost in My House. The Fall version got to number 30 in the charts. The group would also cover Taylor's only other UK hit, Got a CJ in 2001 on Are You Our Missing Winner, another Motown single by a white guy. I mean, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> As an annotated fall point out, when he tried to explain the Motown situation a year later, he kind of made it sound worse. Now, I'm not going to go through all this at the time. He gives this explanation in the interview and then immediately starts going on about what, how he, as a working class white man, doesn't... Uh, doesn't need to be uh, have to worry about his what he says around black immigrants and Irish immigrants. And later he claimed he was being sarcastic. It doesn't read like sarcasm, it reads like saloon bar casual racism in the cold light of day. Weirdly enough though, when the fall brought the song back to play live in 2002, they left the offending line out that shows that in the new millennium the times they were a changing for everyone, even the fall. But what is the song about? I think it seems clear that the protagonist is working on some kind of arts or music program. And the only line for me, there is no culture is my brag, feels like a sideswipe at Melvin Bragg. Now he was the host of like the South Bank show at the time. And I get the feeling that this is the kind of show with its kind of box ticking that's really got on Smith's nerves. But also it seems like the protagonist has a problem with women and gay people as well. Too much reliance on girls here, behind every shell actor, queer and deformed. And a lot of irritation, maybe a bit more understandably, towards new romantics. So as a chronic alcoholic and coward, I kicked dirt over all this and more when I wrote about Hex in 2006. But what do I say about Hex in 2018 as a venerable, sober, to totally ripped and buff writer? My serious answer is this, who gives a fuck what I think? There has been a wider shift in culture, not just since this song was written, but since I became a music writer in 2003, and really has nothing to do with Mark E. Smith and everything to do with me as a white guy. This history of rock music can essentially be viewed as a bunch of white hipsters telling us what it is and isn't okay. And they've always told us that it's totally fine, yeah, for white musicians to be using this language how magnanimous of them. So really, the main thing I wanted to say is that it's probably about time we started, and if I had had this idea uh, uh, any earlier than eight o'clock last night, I probably would have floated it past Michael, but as it was, it was too late. Um, I, I thought it was about time we started asking POC writers what they think of songs, not just like the classical, 
but all the others I mentioned earlier as well. Like, like I say, I sent out a few emails and um, uh, luckily for me, I caught a couple of people next to their computers. So, my man, Gabriel Abulu of the excellent three-track podcast, who's a massive fall fan and only invited me to go on this program because he's into the fall and was, looked like he was going to start crying when I wanted to talk to him about Rihanna. He says this, I think you're absolutely right asking uh, POC people about this. To a point, unfortunately, I feel as, as though, like, as a black man, liking music made by mainly white people means I will have to wince every now and then at the lyrics. Not to mention whatever Morrissey says ever when he opens his mouth. <laughs> but my rationale is that as long as it's not intended to harm, I try not to take it to harm, which leaves a lot of grey area, to be honest. For example, in The Gun Club, was Jeffrey Lee Pierce singing as a character in a story in the South? Hmm. But most of the time you can tell the difference, or at least I can feel it out, if that makes sense. As far as the classical goes, I never felt it. The word always sticks out, as it always will, but I never felt it to be intending harm or malice. In the context of the song, it's still pretty bad, as the words feel forced. So I'm not forgiving the use or sweeping it under the carpet, but I've ne it's never made me that type of way. That might just be because of my love of the fall and their work being more important to me than just this lyric, but for me it's just an unfortunate blemish on an amazing song which is on an even more amazing album. So it's tough. The lyrics of the classical have made me uncomfortable and the word is a racist word, you can't really say it's not, it's just that I never took offence to it in the way that I have to other lyrics written by Jeffrey Lee Pierce. Now, there you go. The world, my mate Kieran Akarea as well, like um, one of my um, writers over in Northern Ireland who happens to be Indian by descent, he just sent me a text just now saying, it's not racist, what are you on about? So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave it to Gabriel and Kieran to like, you know, answer the question for me. So there are 100 questions raised by Hex Induction now, and we've only got time to look at one of them in depth, which we've just done, hopefully. And now I thought I wanted to look very, very briefly at something else. Is this LP a spell? <laughs> Have a bleeding guess. <laughs> of course it is. The clue's in the title, Hex Induction Hour. It's a set of ritually chosen words invoked to effect a change in reality. But for me, the magic ritual was not just one which primarily broke a five-year run of bad luck, which, let's face it, it was hardly a Faustian pact he made, signing with camera and getting his record all the way to number 70 in the charts, and you know, the much coveted number two spot in the indie charts. But you know, I mean, it did, it did change things for the band, but also it did other things, didn't it? As far as I'm concerned, it changed the world round the band. The world changed round the fall because it had to. Just step sideways with me into a world where M.R. James, H.P. Lovecraft, Philip K. Dick, and Arthur Macken are not exactly the mainstream, have gone from being laughable, genre bound pulp cases to hit core celebra. Hex was an album eulogised by the late great Mark Fisher not least in his final book, The Weird and the Eerie, which came out last year on Repeater. And it just goes, and this is what I'm saying, you see you've got tons of books coming out at the moment, all wanting to, tri all tripping over themselves to talk about the eeriness of H.P. Lovecraft, of Arthur Macken, of uh, Call of Cthulhu, of like the stories of Philip K. Dick, and all of them, but all of them mention Marky Smith because it was Marky e. Smith, almost single-handedly as far as I'm concerned, who brought these people back into the national consciousness, to what extent they, you know, he has done. Um, before the 1980s, Lovecraft, Macken, Philip K. Dick and Colin Wilson were all but forgotten, spent cultural forces. I see Hex as being the first psychic battle in the great weird fiction fight back, which ended in not really an outright victory, but a state of affairs that would have been unthinkable in the 70s. These authors are now getting TV shows on Channel 4, um, you know, and if you can, Black Mirror is a bit of a cheapo knockoff on Netflix as well. University courses, films, biographies after biographies, they're being discussed at dinner parties, probably a stone throw away from here, cocaine parties as well, no doubt. 
all over Dalston, Hackney Wick, Salford Media City, Peckham Rye, Margate, all places like that. <laughs> Where's the evidence for this album being a spell? Well, there isn't there isn't that evidence for it being a spell. It's, it's all over the bloody thing. For example, here's Colin Wilson in the enchantment of Deer Park. Have you been to the English Deer Park? It's a large type artist ranch. This is where C. Wilson wrote Ritual in the Dark. Have you been to the English Deer Park? The book referenced here is Ritual in the Dark, an occult thriller about the hunt for a modern day Jack the Ripper, who was, of course, don't at me haters, Michael Maybrick, a popular singer of his day and Masonic lunatic sadist, protected by the mystic tie, carrying out one of the most disgusting, if completely audacious, occult rituals himself that has ever happened in history. Here's the cursed mandible of Jawbone and the Air Rifle, a song which according to Mark Fisher in an essay entitled The Falls Pulp Modernism, Marky e. Smith after the fall, art, music and politics, is a tissue of illusions, such as to M.R. James's tales, a warning to the curious, a whistle and I'll come to you my lad, Lovecraft, Hammer Horror, and to the Wicker Man. And what's the Wicker Man built on? Based on? Smith would have had this book. He would have been one of the few people, I'm guessing he would have known about it at the very least. It's based on a book called Ritual. And as Dread Night follows Dank Day, here's the most magical fall song of all. Winter, winter, entrances uncovered. With the clear double meaning, entrancer is uncovered. The entrancer is uncovered. The magician is revealed. Entrancer is uncovered. As is typical for an occult ritual, there is an inversion of what is normally expected. Winter, by any other songwriter, would mean a snow-covered landscape, meaning things are simplified and covered up. With Smith, all we get is dying leaves have fallen off the branches, revealing things that are usually hidden, or should be hidden, or occluded which in this case is ostensibly a mad child being possessed by the spirit of an alcoholic. But this in itself is a cipher for hidden knowledge wrecking damage on those unable to cope with it. His left side, south side walk referring to widdershins, to clamper clockwise walk round a building to cast a spell. And here, on Hip Priest, overseeing the whole ritual, is the hipster cleric himself with his hypnotic induction process drinking the long draught. Hypnotic induction process HIP. The entrancer is uncovered. And at this point, I was going to um, attempt to do a magic ritual myself. I might still do it actually. Just bear with me. Nothing in the hat. Okay. This is a genuine magician's hat. Entrance, entrancer, I should say is uncovered. The magician, you can say I've been practicing this, <laughs> the magician reveals himself. Come on, fuck you rabbit. <laughs> oh, the CD doesn't fit. Anyway, listen, what I was going to do, I was going to end my amazing speech by going, da-da, hey. <laughs> It literally doesn't get any better than that <laughs> in my life. Uh, anyway, enjoy Hex and Hex and Ocean Hour. Cheers. <laughs>